I was thinking you talk about relationships all the time. Me and you should sell a heartbreak potion in a little jar for 50 cents. Now I understand that you're such a heartbreaker. I welcome you to Indonesia. I'll be personally hosting you here. Can you handle a diva like me? I don't know. I can handle anyone. You're still too young for being a diva. I feel it's very sad that we live on such fertile soil and people are hungry and children are hungry. We are already consuming the soil that belongs to the unborn child. This is a crime. Namaskaram, Ralin. Good morning to you. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. <laughs> well, it's such a joy to um, meet you. Such a pleasure. Uh, I'm such a big fan, obviously, and uh, I'm sure all your calls start this way with people just ooh ah uh, googling over you. <laughs> so I'll get that over and done with. Um, I I wanted to say thank you for the honor of uh, talking to, you, being able to talk to you, it's, and thank you for pleasure. trusting me. It's my pleasure. And the only island I visited in Indonesia is the Bali. I have not come to the other islands. <laughs> well, I am in Bali right now. Oh, um, really? And, uh, so today there's a few questions that I have for you. Um, first is, I know it's big on your agenda this year for the Save the Soil project. And I'm here to support you in any way I can. Um, I'm here to advocate for you in Indonesia. If I have the capacity to do so, I'll gladly do that. Uh, the question I have for you is, how do we get people excited, um, invested, and super just revved up for this movement? Because in Indonesia, as you know, a lot of farmers are also just struggling to put food on the table. So it's not really top of mind for them. And then for the young people, People, they don't see the significance because they can see that Indonesian land is still fertile, it's still green. They can't make that connection. Obviously, it's a consciousness aspect, but uh, beyond that, how can I do it, you know, as a, as a public person, as a human being? And what are the small steps that people can take starting from today to join this movement or to be more conscious of our soil? So, <laughs> Ralin, in lighter way, and I must tell this to you, I was talking to Lawrence Bender and we were planning to make a short documentary how to, you know, pass this message on to people. So he told me, Sadhguru, you must make a horror movie, otherwise people are not going to wake up <laughs> I said, see, I don't believe in uh, painting a black picture of everything. Yes, some things are dire, some things are looking dangerous, but all these statistics are cold statistics based on facts. But they're not taking into account what is beating in our hearts. Right. You, me and a million other people, if we give uh, expression to what's beating in our hearts, our concern and love for all life around us, well, what will happen after twenty years will be something totally different from what the stats are saying. So I said, no, no, I don't want a horror movie. I want an inspiration, I want people to understand. We are in a cusp of time where in the next twelve to fifteen years, we can make a huge difference, literally turning life back around. It is possible to do that. Every nation, irrespective of their economic condition, can do it. It's just that a determination and a commitment is needed from the people. Because most nations are democratic, people have not expressed any long-term desire. They're all asking for daily trinkets. So this effort is to move 3.5 billion people in the world, which is sixty percent of the world's electorate, to say that we are willing to support you, whichever government you are, we are willing to support you if you talk about long-term well-being of our nation. When it comes to ecological issues, we can't ta talk in terms of nations, it is a global issue, but we talk about nations because administratively, it is a largest group of people you can address, that is what a nation is. So in that sense, every nation can make a policy to turn this around and it's possible. But if we don't do it now, let us say we allow it to go on for another thirty to forty years. Forty years later, if we make up our minds, forty years later when I'm dead and gone, another Sadhguru came up and he wants to do it. He cannot do it because by then the biodiversity loss would have reached a point where it will take hundred and fifty to two hundred years to turn it around. 
So this is our responsibility and this is our privilege that we have the capability, we are at a time when we can actually turn it around. So having said that, in Indonesia, why should I do it? In an island, everything looks beautiful, you look at the ocean, it's beautiful. Uh, what is beneath that is another point, pr problem, but visually it looks beautiful, all the greenery. And you are right now in Bali, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world, everybody feels that way. So, that is fine. But what you need to know is, see the figures in Indonesia are available only till 1970. In 1940, your soil organic carbon content was 2.11 percent. In 1970, it is 0.76 percent. By now, it will be well below… below 0.5 percent. This is… this means you are on the verge of de desertification. When I say verge of desertification, I do not have knowledge about this, I'm… but I'm just saying generally, out of seventeen thousand islands, I believe only uh, seven thousand or something is habitable, rest are not habitable. Why are they not habitable? Maybe the l land strips are too narrow, the ocean comes over them, that may be one thing. Otherwise, they are not habitable simply because the volcanic ashes have not reached there, there is no fertility in them, there is no vegetation. Yeah. That will be the real reason in most of the Pacific Islands, that is what the thing is about. And you have lost forty percent of mangroves in thirty years' time. And you have lost ten million hectares of forest in t twenty years' time. This is a disaster unfolding. You want something yeah. really horrific to happen, do you want horror to happen? Or do you want to m mitigate it before it comes? This is all the question there is. Being human beings, yeah. we have the necessary intelligence to foresee things and avoid those things. Whether it's your personal life or the life of our children or the life of our nation or the life of this planet, we have the ability to foresee a few things and mitigate those things. Some things may be beyond us, what's beyond us we cannot do anything about it. This is a fundamental in everybody's life. Yeah. See, in our life, what we cannot do, if we do not do, there's no problem. What we can do, if we do not do, that's a disastrous life. That disaster is happening, what we can do, we are not doing. So what's the problem with Indonesia? These are the problems. And uh, they're telling uh, farmers are giving up and they're saying by 2060, there may be no farmers left. No farmers left means what are you Indonesian people going to eat after that? You will import food, right? You will import food. Yeah. When there is food shortage, We're let's… Really to... Let us say food is going from India, let us say, for example. L when there is food shortage in India, we will break… break all the commitments we have made to you. We will not send food. This is true with any nation. When there is food shortage in this country, will we export, I'm asking? Will any country export? No. So it's very important for every nation. We may get a few things from outside. But every nation, for every community, for every region, food should be produced where people are living. It's very, very important. That is a long-term security. See, we have just forgotten, for example, in India in 1940s, we've had famines. One famine in a matter of four months killed 3.2 million people. And when people starve to death, it's not easy, a bomb would be easier, you know? A big bomb which killed three million people is not a problem because in one moment they will go. But starvation is not like that, four months they died slowly. First your children die, then your parents die. The strongest one, the young ones will die lost. You will see all those things happening apart from your physical suffering. What you go through, letting your children die, letting your old parents die, then only you die. This should never happen to humanity once again. After all this technology, if all these signs and conveniences we have created, if we once again drive countries in that direction, well, this may look like, oh, such a thing is not happening, why the store is full of food? But I want you to know, in the year 2020, the World Food Program spent nine billion dollars distributing food in Africa. This year, David Beasley, who is heading the organization, telling me they need fifteen billion dollars because the number of famines this year in Africa has gone up. And he's saying in the next two to three years, by 2025, they may need fifty billion dollars to distribute food. How long will you keep populations, whole populations going by distributing food that's coming from any… somewhere else? I'm saying you may be importing it. 
Importing is also the same thing, you may be paying money for it. Whether you pay money or you get it free, that's not the problem. The food is coming from elsewhere means this population has no food security. That means this population has no life security. The people in Indonesia must understand this, that what basic food we need, we must grow. You can... at least your bread should grow in your uh, land. Butter you can get from somewhere else, because tomorrow if there's no butter, you can still eat the bread. At least the basic bread must be grown in our own lands in every country, otherwise those populations are not secure. I... I completely agree. Actually, there's two things I suggest we can do. One is, um, I know you started recovery, recovery calling in India. Maybe uh, some of your volunteers can help us um, help the farmers here locally in Indonesia to set up sustainable ways of growing and natural farming because some of them are very interested, but maybe they don't have the knowledge and the tools. And the second is, actually one and a half years ago, in my meditation, I thought I wanted to start this program of my own called Food for Life program because I went to Sumba, an island quite close to Bali, and I saw that people were starving. Uh, kids were malnourished. They had stunting in their brains. And this island was lush and green and beautiful. Of course, they have dry seasons. But why are people starving? So I thought maybe I could start a program where we could find local um, veg vegetables, local things full of protein, that people used to eat in those areas but no longer do because of modernization and create a menu or uh, a recipe book for different areas in Indonesia where they could just pick things or grow things on their own and sustain, um, sustain life and help their families so then they can focus on other things. Because what we were giving away when I was in Sumba with another uh, charity, charitable organization was actually just milk and things that they never took anyway in Sumba, bread, milk, um, some other formulas that were not natural to the people there. So I thought this could be a good idea. So I started talking to nutritionists and seeing um, things, but you know, life gets in the way and then you say, okay, I'll do it next year. Okay, I'll do it next year. But you being you and starting this Save for Soil program and making it happen right away, I don't know if you think my idea is a good idea, but I think every province, every area actually has foods growing naturally, but they just don't understand the, they don't have the knowledge of what to, you know, how to cook it, how to, how to uh, grow it, what, what can be, uh, what can be put to use to fulfill the nutritional requirements of children to grow properly and as they should. We definitely can uh, say oppose this journey that we are doing. We are setting up a committee of people with the necessary scientific skills and stuff. If you want, I can send a couple of people who will travel a few... Yeah. few islands, visit a few islands and come up with what can be done there. Uh, because let them come and physically see it, otherwise if you can send all the data, the number of square miles, populations there, mm -hmm. what is the type of soil, what is right now growing there, in the past what were they growing, why it has gone back to where they are today. If this kind of data if you send, I will at least know whom to send for you. And we will set up right. a committee to handhold the governments. We are setting up a group of twenty-five yeah. people. For at least twenty-four months, we will have them done. If you support us, we will see that uh, we will take up some parts. We are doing this, we are signing something with UAE to do this in the desert lands. Similarly, we can do something here, it's very much possible. Uh, if, you know, if uh, your heart's be a heart beats for it, it can't be stopped, it has to be done. Yeah, it really does have to be done because I feel it's very sad that we live on such fertile soil and people are hungry and children are hungry. And humans are being born into this earth and they cannot grow to their full potential because physically they cannot absorb the knowledge and the beauty that there is in the world. My bus next business plan for you is, I was thinking you talk about relationships all the time. Me and you should sell a heartbreak potion in a little jar for 50 cents mm -hmm. and then we can use that money to save the soil. Because people are more concerned with romantic relationships and how to get rid of their pain, then maybe with that, they can start being enlightened because that would be 
either it would work or it's a placebo oh, uh, but i already I think this is good <laughs> I, al- i i already got a hot glue you know if they drink that it'll just get stuck they can't break it really where do you yeah. get that i i got a potion like that it's a glue if they drink it it'll is just it? stick can i get some i'll buy um 3 liters <laughs> <laughs> now i understand that you're such a heartbreaker <laughs> yeah, I need to give it to them so I get karma, good karma. <laughs> well, I my last question would be um, you know, this is from my mother. My mother said uh, that well, there's two more questions, one from me and one from my mom. But my mom's question was, you know, in all cultures we believe in doomsday and in Islam we believe in hari kiamat where, you know, the earth uh, all civilizations and and the sun is about a hand with the wave from your head do you think that climate change is you know is a part of the journey towards that inevitability and are you trying to delay or stop it with the save the soil movement i know it's a far fetched idea but my mom has a great <laughs> imagination which is how i ended up an actress i guess <laughs> <laughs> so uh uh every culture every individual human being actually within themselves have always a doomsday prediction all this is simply because they are not able to address the fundamental fact of their own mortality somewhere deep inside you know you will die you would like everything to die when you die <laughs> unfortunately this is deep down in the human psyche every culture comes up with this everybody have their own doomsday but the thing is will we cause it or are are we going to be the cause of the doomsday that one thing we must avoid if it happens by nature let it happen that's a different thing but you and me should not cause cause doomsday to others isn't it <laughs> no <laughs> at least not you cuz you have an image of holes <laughs> i'm a little yeah. rascal <laughs> <laughs> whoever you are don't cause doomsday for the world <laughs> right now right now when in indonesia we are talking about in 20 years some millions of hectares of uh, forest is gone we are causing doomsday this is not just in indonesia across the world when soil fertility is going away when 62% of india's soil is below 0.5% organic content we are we are manufacturing a doomsday so doomsday does not mean everybody has to die suppose we kill half the population that's a doomsday every responsible scientist in the world is pointing out by 2045 we will be producing 40% less food on the planet and our population will be 9.2 billion that's not a world you want to live in nor you want your children to live in that is going to be a disastrous world does it mean to say every life on every human being will die no half the people will die in the most miserable way others will live in fear that is bad enough isn't it that's true that's true whatever civilizations we have built it might have taken 1000 years to build a civilization but once there is food shortage in a given city or in a village within a week's time your civilization will be gone everybody will be behaving like animals i agree with that um that's a quite a horror story by the way if you do produce that horror movie um i volunteer to be a free talent in that movie <laughs> <laughs> how how do i how do i make somebody as beautiful as you you look horrific i can do that come on i am qualified not you <laughs> there's always makeup to make me look scary trust me i don't wake up looking like this so <laughs> just you know <laughs> my last question and i think this is the one that's closest to my heart So I'm born a Muslim and I'm a faithful Muslim and also I'm a very avid follower of, of yours and I believe in your teachings and the tools that you use have helped me tremendously in my modern life. How do I navigate between the two and as a public figure and being in the most populous Muslim country express um how important it is to kind of have balance and um to not seem like i'm offending the muslim community by following a guru such as you to make it 
uh, to express it in a politically correct way because there's so many people, you know, I'm helping trying to save the soil it has nothing to do with religion. And a lot of people are a little bit cautious or fearful. Oh, is Raleen, you know, being blasphemous? Is she supporting uh, another religion? Is she supporting another belief system? When actually it's a humanitarian problem. So how do I navigate these two and how do I express it in words that love and humanity is, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with religion. So one thing is, Ralin, you should not follow me. I'm planning to use you as my face, so I will be behind you. You're not behind me, <laughs> so nobody should have any problem <laughs> with me. And anyway, uh, I uh, personally, I do not identify with any particular religion. We must understand, when you say I am born as this religion, as that religion, it's a social reality, it's a cultural reality, we are all born into yeah. something, all right? So, yeah. that should not impede us from being as human as we have to be, as human beings. So, being human means this. Being human means, see, every other creature identifies with its own species and everything else it will try to eat. This being human means our experience of life, goes beyond the identity of who we are. Even our physical form of being a man or woman, of being a human being, our identity goes beyond that, that we are capable of looking at life much larger. We have been given the necessary intelligence and awareness to look at ourselves well beyond the limitations of what we may be born into or what we might have grown up into as. I am not even talking about religion, I am talking about humanity itself. As a species, okay. we are able to look beyond that. So, why should any religion or any philosophy, anything should be restrictive for one's humanity? These restrictions are put so that you don't lose your humanity. See, yeah. re in every culture there are some restrictions. At least the intention be be uh, behind those restrictions is so that you don't lose your humanity and become like an animal once again. Because it took millions of years of evolution to get you here, they don't want you to fall back. It's like this, let's say you're climbing a hill in your car and it starts rolling back. We go and keep a stone behind it so that it doesn't roll back. Now you go away. The next person I, who drives there, for him this rock is an obstruction. It is not letting him go forward. So this is what we are doing. We must understand any restriction in your religion or in any religion in any society at that time was put with the good intention that you don't roll back and become animalistic, you must move forward. Yeah. But now, after time rolls on, now that rock which was at the behind your wheel is unfortunately in front of your wheel. No, you must move it. You must move it the way it should be moved with utmost respect and regard for the intention with which the rock was put, all right? Okay. It, the, it yeah. is not about the rock, it is the intention behind the rock. So all these restrictions were for a given society so that people don't fall back and become animalistic. So now you don't have to follow me, I will keep you in the front and I will be behind you, all right? <laughs> Let anybody not get upset because whether you are a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or whatever you think you are, we all come from the soil, eat from the soil. When we die, we go back into the soil. Let's not forget this. At least in this one thing, irrespective of our religion, race, nationality, caste, creed, whatever different ways we have found to divide humanity, let's go beyond that and bring solution because we are in a cusp of time. It's our privilege and a tremendous responsibility. If we do the right things in the next fifteen to twenty years, we can turn back the soil in a significant way. It's possible only for this generation. If you let it go for another thirty, forty years, they will not be able to do it because the loss will be too big. So please, uh, everybody, whoever you are, I consider you as a human being, whether you are a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, it doesn't matter, we all are children of this Mother Earth soil. So let us yeah. see how to protect that for ourselves and for the unborn child. Whether it's yours or mine, what does it matter? The important thing is right now as a generation, we are already consuming the soil that belongs to the unborn child. This is a crime. 
This is a crime that every one of us are committing. I am just seeing how to reverse that. And it's possible to reverse that. Already many governments are coming together and saying, yes, this must happen. Many are already changing the policies, allocating budgets, things like that. For smaller nations where they may not have the necessary research and scientific facilities, we are willing to handhold them. I would love to come to Indonesia and work with you and make that happen. Personally, I don't know how much time, but I will send you the right people who can do this. And with your commitment, I'm sure we can make this happen in Indonesia. And all the Muslim brothers and sisters, let them understand this is about life. Everything that you call as religion is about enhancing life, always enhancing life. Different cultures may have, might have arrived at it in different ways, but every religion, every philosophy, every morality is always about protecting, safeguarding and enhancing life, isn't it? Not restricting and crushing life. So let us not misunderstand this. Let us not misunderstand into the… With whatever religion we are born into and make it a suffocating atmosphere for our humanity. Our heart should beat for everything, not for this or that. That's correct. Thank you, Sadhguru. We, I welcome you to Indonesia. I'll be personally hosting you here. You must, um, you must sure. come and visit us once here. Can you handle a diva like me? I don't know. I can't <laughs> handle anybody. I can handle anyone. <laughs> oh, you're a diva, is it? You're still too young for being a diva. You see that, <laughs> the mountains in the back? <laughs> Beautiful, wow. <laughs> Beautiful. I can't wait to come visit you, Sadhguru. I'm... Uh, recently working on a very funny uh, sounding album, but I'm sure you will have some inspirations and words for me. I'm looking forward to it. It's called you're, you're a making Platonic mu Love Album. You're, you're making music also? <laughs> no, I'm not a musician, but I realize that there's lacking. Platonic love is lacking in the music, you know, themes of music. People are always talking about body-based relationships romantic relationships i'm gonna make an album of platonic love love for the soil love for you guru love for life <laughs> <laughs> why not see uh, love should not be a compulsion about doing something or uh, you know in a particular way uh, love is the sweetness of your heart that must be on for everything everything yeah it is well i love you very much i love everything <laughs> you're you. doing i'm committed Sometime um, this year, so, sometime this year, you must visit us here in India. I promise, I will. Yes. Let, give me an let's, invite. Let's I make welcome it happen. you to Indonesia. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. I love you. Wonderful, See wonderful you talking. Bye. Bye.